This uh, third conference for Saturday is entitled Spiritual Exercise in the Womb of the World with Holy Mother the Church and Examination of Conscience. So we'll just take a few moments of uh, silence to recollect ourselves after that beautiful chaplet that we've just sung and to uh, call upon Christ's presence and his merciful love. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In the prayer of memory that we talked about this morning, we focused more on the importance of uh, counting our blessings, remembering the many ways in which God has favored us throughout our lives in order to enhance the gratitude that we feel in our hearts towards the good God who has given us every, every good gift. Memory, as St. Ignatius understood it, is also important for recalling uh, the failures, the weaknesses, and the sins of our life as well, which, in which uh, an examination of conscience um, exists. It, it is to recall through our memory the ways in which we've fallen short of the call of God to his love and to the love of neighbor as self. And so uh, this afternoon's talk will be a little bit different form of an examination of conscience. Um, you have in your, I think, your retreat packet a really very thorough examination of conscience of a more traditional sort, going commandment by commandment and looking at the ways in which you don't have that in your packet. Okay. <laughs> well, that's okay. I'm not going to do that kind of an examination of conscience anyway. It's, that's more a more standard approach to sort of go down through the Ten Commandments, the precepts of the church, perhaps the Beatitudes, to look at the ways in which we've fallen short of our uh, call to love, to our uh, call to Christian discipleship. Rather, what I want to do is uh, a kind of an examination of conscience that is more, uh, in one way it's more clinical. It's like uh, looking at the symptoms of sin and patterns of sin in our life, looking at the emotional states of the soul and how they might give us a clue to where the patterns of sin are that that we have in our lives. I know a number of you have already gone to confession this morning. Uh, perhaps some of you are still waiting to go to confession this afternoon with Father. Uh, in any case, I hope that this examination of conscience will, uh, will be helpful. There's a, a, a parable about a child who was conceived in her mother's womb with the ability to determine her own um, uterine development based upon the evidence surrounding her. And she had the capacity to affect the way that she would develop. And as she began to develop little leg and arm stubs, she said to herself, why should I waste any energy on developing these? I, Mom carries me everywhere I need to go. I don't need legs. I don't need arms. There's nothing to reach out for. I'll save my energy for other things. And as the child begins to develop, she uh, recognizes that her eyes are beginning to develop. She's going, well, what need have I for eyes in the womb? Um, there's nothing to see. Uh, it's dark in here. This is sort of a waste of my time and my energy. So I don't want eyes. And she doesn't develop eyes. And then uh, she develops, begins to develop a tongue. 
What need have I of a tongue? There's no one, let's see, I've just checked, no twin here. There's nobody to talk to. Based on the evidence around me, I don't need a tongue. There's no sense in developing a tongue. There's no one to talk to. And of course, when the child then is born, she is woefully unprepared to enjoy the blessings of physical life outside the womb that could not be detected inside the womb. womb. Now, uh, fortunately, children don't have that choice. Sadly, some do not develop fully and have handicaps and so on and are born that way. But they still have, they're, they're, still, they're still better prepared for life and at least they, they weren't responsible for their own condition. But there's a sense in which we, all of us, live in the womb of the world. Our lifetimes, however long or short they might be, are a preparation period for birth into a much more glorious kind of life in the eternal kingdom of God in heaven. And like the child in the womb, we can't really see or detect that life because we've not been to heaven and back to know what it is that we need to prepare for. And unfortunately, living in the womb of the world, unlike the child in the womb, we do have the power to say, I don't need to pray. I don't need God. I can't see God. I can't see the benefit of prayer to a being that I'm not even sure exists. Why do I need to prepare for some kind of life that I, I, there's no evidence for it. Show it to me. And so we have the ability in the womb of the world, which really is a womb, a very, a very it's a great, it's a great gift to be sure, but it's only the smallest foretaste of the glories and the joys that await us in heaven as Christ himself have, has told us. And as we've heard in the scripture from Paul and others, no eye has seen, no ear has heard the, the joys that God has prayed, prepared for those who love him. But we do have the choice. We, we can. We're the only ones that can cut off the chance to enjoy that kind of life. And there's a sense in which in the world we can engage in the spiritual exercise that we need to through prayer, through communion with God, to be much more aware of, much more desirous and yearning for those joys in that kingdom. So that on, on our, the day of our death, which is the day of our birth into the eternal kingdom, we're much better prepared if we've prayed and done our spiritual exercises for the joys of the kingdom to come. And the mother that we have in the womb of the world is Holy Mother Church. The gift that Christ has given to us to prepare us for the joys of his Father's kingdom. The sole purpose for the existence of the church is for the sanctification of the flock, for our holiness. That's why Christ established it and gave it his authority and his power through the life of the sacraments, one of which, an important one of which, is the sacrament of reconciliation, by which our soul is restored to the grace that God desires for us. And in order to, um, to prepare for that eternal life, it's important that we have a certain docility for that Holy Mother that we have that exists only for our sanctification. And which that Holy Mother which spent three years with the, with the Lord and heard the whole tradition, the great sacred tradition of his teaching, beyond that which is recorded in, in the scriptures, which is beautiful enough in itself, but does not include the full deposit of revelation. And so like good sons and daughters of the church, like good children, we need to learn docility and obedience before what the church teaches about what God wants us to do to prepare for 
the eternal kingdom that he invites all of us to be part of. And so in our examination of conscience, one of the things we can ask ourselves is the question, how docile am I to the teachings of the church? Have I made a decision that some are worthy of my belief and practice and others are not? And if we've come to that conclusion, the question we could ask ourselves is, who gave us the authority to make that distinction? The church itself is the bride of Christ that exists solely for our sanctification. Shouldn't we listen with a docile voice to what she teaches? And in fact, the tendency for uh, many Catholics today is to say, well, yeah, there's a lot that the church teaches that I really love, and and I, I buy that. But over here, I can't go there. There's certain things I can't abide. And that's the sin of pride is at work there, which is dangerous because in that in, we're holding back from the fullness of God's love and the full obedience to, the, to our mother, which, which is the, the church itself. As we think about um, our failures and our sins, one of the things that we need to be aware of is that when we approach the church, we want to approach the church in confession, recognizing that Christ himself has established this sacrament for our good. And what what we meet in the sacrament of reconciliation, there's a priest there to be sure, but he is Christ's representative on earth. Uh, He's merely, as um, St. Faustina says in her diary, the priest is merely a screen. Don't judge the priest. He's merely a screen through which Christ hears the the contrition of the penitent and offers absolution through the voice of the priest so that we can be confident that we indeed are forgiven of our sins. And it's, I think, helpful to recall the circumstances in which this sacrament is recorded to have been established by Christ in the Gospels. First at Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus asked, who do they say that I am? And Peter cries out, you are uh, the Christ, the son of the living God. And and Jesus says to him, you've not learned this from man. This comes to you from the spirit of God, from the spirit of my father, the Holy Spirit, this knowledge that you've just articulated. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Uh, I I give you the keys to the kingdom. And not even the uh, gates of hell shall prevail against it. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you retain are retained. Right there we see him conferring the power of absolution of sins upon the the church. And then to remind them, his apostles, especially to remind them at a time in which their consciences must have been extremely tender, on the night of Christ's resurrection, he appears to the apostles again. This is recorded in the Gospel of St. John. I think it's chapter 21. And he says, he says, peace be be with you. And it says, it reports that he breathed his spirit upon them and said, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, whose sins you retain are retained. At a time when all of them would have been keenly aware of how they had um, abandoned him, denied him, at a time when they're aware most keenly of their own need for mercy, Jesus reminds them of the sacramental uh, mercy and grace that he's given to them to become the means by which sin can be forgiven. And before he, he ascends into heaven, he tells them once again their great commission is to go preach and teach the gospel and to baptize for the remission of the sin in the world. And so the church, priests, um, priests are supposed to be an instrument of God's mercy in this sacrament. And so we should have every confidence to, to make a good and a complete confession, a worthy confession, so that the peace and the joy, 
the sanctifying grace that comes from that sacrament might inhab inhabit our souls. Now, there's one thing in general that we need to be aware of um, in terms of our psychology as sinners, right? Um, one of the things that we need to look at is, or the question that we have to need to ask ourselves is really simple. What am I trying to hide? What am I trying to hide from my neighbor about myself? What am I trying to hide from my spouse? What am I trying to hide from uh, myself? What am I trying to hide from God? If there's anything that we're trying to hide that we don't want to admit about ourselves, a certain kind of shameful thing that we've thought, said, or done that we've never confessed before, now's the time to disburden ourselves of that. Because wherever there's uh, deception like that, self-deception or deception of others, it typically indicates that there's darkness in the soul that we're ashamed of and we do not want to admit. And shame is a, uh, a trick of the devil to convince us that we're not worthy of God's love. Don't tell the priest that. He'll think so badly of you, you worthless lout. Don't go there. He's going to laugh when he hears. Believe me, I've never heard a priest laugh in a confession. I've never heard him say, you did what? I've never heard that. You know, that's just, uh, maybe it's happened somewhere. But uh, you can't, frankly, you can't shock a priest. They've heard just about everything. And the best thing, first of all, to, to keep on, to hold on to that deception is something that is not allowing us to be in full and complete union with God's mercy. Um, and deception is really a tricky deal because what we're doing is lying down with the devil. He's, Jesus called him the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning. That's how Adam and Eve first got into trouble. And what was it that the devil used to prevent them, Adam and Eve from going to their father in heaven and confessing their sin? Shame. That was for... <laughs> That was for theatrical effect. <laughs> Shame. If you think about it, what was it uh, God said to Adam, where are you? Now, he already knows where Adam is spatially, but that's a spiritual question. And Adam says, well, I, you know, I ran away. I'm trying to hide from you because, oh, well, you've eaten from the tree. Yeah, but she made me do it. And then he turns to Eve and asks her, and you? And does she take responsibility? No, she blames the serpent. And so what happens here is that in a sense their shame, they're running further away from God. He's, he's offering them an opportunity to seek forgiveness. And they don't do that. Their pride picks up and they say, it's not my fault. She did it. He did it. It's the transfer of blame, the refusal to accept responsibility, the shame, the placing of the fig leaves to hide nakedness. Shame keeps them running away from God. We don't want to allow the feelings of shame that we have to deprive us of making a good confession. Uh, and so if we're trying to hide something or it's something that we're ashamed of, we don't want to admit to anybody, let alone a priest in the confessional. The best way to handle that is to put that at the top of the list, get it over with real quick, and everything else is going to be a lot easier. Okay? That's one, I think, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard about how to make a good confession. Now, um, deception is there's one particular sin that I think we often engage in that doesn't get enough attention. And that's when we, we're telling the truth about others, right? So there's no sin here against truth as such. But we're passing on information about other people that, while true, is also 
hurtful and damaging to them and to their, to their public image. And often we do that with a great deal of delight because we don't like them. Ooh, serious sin. That's malice. That's hatred that's at work. We might not recognize it. But work, and in fact, in some ways, it's, it's even a more serious sin against the truth than is an actual lie. Because we're, we're, we're claiming to be telling the truth and a lying truth with the malice of Satan, who is the father of lies. It's called the sin of detraction. And it's something I think, I, I mean, I have found in my own life that this is something I have to watch very carefully teaching at a university, bonfire of the vanities, a lot of pride, egos involved there. It's easy to make damaging statements about others, even though they may be perfectly true, but they're passed on in a malicious spirit, in a spirit of genuine evil. So we need, we need to examine that aspect of, uh, it's not deception, but it is a, a misuse and abuse of the truth. You've heard of the seven deadly sins. Uh, there was even a movie some years ago made it called simply Seven, in which there was a popularization of pride and sloth, of anger, of envy, of greed, of gluttony, of lust. Those, those are sometimes, uh, these are what I would call really, and the church regards as seven uh, capital tendencies to sin. Um, f feelings of pride, a kind of an, of an indifference, of even lust and of gluttony and of anger, of envy, rattle around all the time in our, in our souls. And the first presentation of the emotion is not itself a sin, but it's a presentation, it's a temptation to us to grab a hold of it and sort of dwell in that. And when we begin to do that, then we're, we're marching towards the land of venial sin first and maybe even mortal sin if we cooperate and take too much delight in the temptation that our emotions present to us. Um, pride is a, is a, we've already talked about that in the, uh, just a few moments ago and in the earlier session. Particularly damaging, it's referred to as the the deadliest of the deadly sins. Because it, it says, I make the rules. I am the center of the world. I, my ego, uh, I'm important. Others are not. The, churches, the church makes mistakes. I'll correct the church. God doesn't know what I, I need, and so uh, thanks God, I'll, I'll take care of this myself. Those kinds of tendencies in the soul that we reviewed a little bit in our exercise of humility in the last talk, are very useful to go through, to take, the, take the, our pride temperature, figure out how high it is, and, and then begin to investigate the ways in which that pride may have drawn us in, seduced us into truly sinful acts that need to be uh, confessed. Um, sloth is one that we don't normally take as seriously anymore. We usually identify that with uh, just plain physical laziness, but, and indeed, to, to not work when we're able to work, to presume on the, the goodness and charity of others when we could just as well be taking care of ourselves, is something we don't want to get into. That, St. Paul warns us against that. If you want to eat, then work. And of course, there are situations in terms of health, in terms of increasing age and so on, in which we can't do that and where we may ultimately have to rely upon the charity of others, we have to have the humility to be able to do that when, when we face those kinds of circumstances in our life. But a more uh, dangerous form of sloth is what the church calls acedia, or spiritual indifference. And this is very pertinent to the themes that we've been talking about throughout this retreat, because it concerns our prayer life. And the, if we're only going to church on Sunday and satisfying our Sunday obligation and then checking out from the spiritual life for the rest of the week, that's not adequate. 
In fact, it's prob probably if we're not praying the rest of the week, we're also probably not really present at Mass. It's just a duty and an obligation, and we're there physically, but we're not involved in the beauty and the grace and the adoration and the worship that takes place at every Mass. And that's the sign of, uh, that's a very dangerous spiritual sign. I don't need to pray. I know in my own personal life, when I first decided that I just didn't need to pray as much, that I was too busy to pay too much attention to God, that's when I can detect that I began to permit myself to do other things that were also quite sinful because there wasn't the communion with God. And we fall into not just spiritual desolation, but into a, a, uh, a loss of the sanctifying grace in our souls when we do that. And as Ignatius says in his spiritual exercises, prayer is the means by which we constantly remain in communion with God. So that when we're in sanctifying grace, we need to continue to pray to stay there. Because if we decide, well, I, I'm in a pretty good place, I'm going to slow down here now. Eventually, the slowdown is no down, and there's no prayer at all, and we slip back easily into the wiles and the temptations of the one who hates us. So how's our prayer life doing? That's a question that we can ask. Am I indifferent to the need to be in communion with God regularly, daily, throughout the day? What am I doing to try to overcome back? How well have I done in uh, perseverance in my prayer life. Then we have various aspects of the, the, actually pride and sloth, especially spiritual indifference, are intellectual sins. They're, they reside in the intellect and their choice is the will to reject the need for God in one way or, or another. But then we look to the kind of the emotional states of our soul and we can see, we can take our temperature there as well. Anger. How much anger have I got lingering around in my soul for past uh, injuries and grievances, for people who have insulted us and injured us? You know what? I, I talked earlier about making a list of our blessings. A good thing to do before we go to confession is make a list of all of the people who have injured us and that we're still aware of having injured us and to make an act of forgiveness for each and every person that's injured us and each and every act of injury. Because anger, anger is a result of, of injustices, um, failures to receive the love that we should have received from those who should have loved us, wounded love. Uh, those are areas where we're especially tender in our souls. And we can easily nurture a resentment and a bitterness, even a hatred of people uh, who have injured us in that way. And so anger, and anger is where that begins. Anger is initially could be completely justified. But as St. Paul and, and Christ himself says, don't let the sun set on your anger. Get rid of it as quickly as you can because it's an acid to the soul. You know, and there's something really kind of foolish, almost comical about our anger. A lot of times we get angry because we've maybe even overheard a conversation that we think was about us. And boy, it's, it gets in there and it's a real burr under the saddle. And we think about it and we're just seething, we're thinking about ways we're going to get back at this person who insulted in this way. And it could be that what they said wasn't even directed to us. But then notice how messed up our soul is with this imagination that gets to working about, oh, there they go again, they're going after me. Um, so just don't, it's, it's best for us not to go there. And um, forgiveness for insult and injury is the best way to forestall the work of anger, which can literally drive charity out of our hearts, not only for the people we're angry at, but for everybody else that we ought to be attentive to and we can't be attentive to and charitable to because we're so angry at somebody else who has wounded us in some way. We're going to the sacrament where we're seeking forgiveness for our sins. What is it that Jesus said we should pray in the Our Father? Forgive us 
our sins as we forgive the sins against us. And in the Gospel of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, of all of the petitions in the Our Father, that's the only one that Jesus reiterates afterwards, saying, if you do not forgive those who have injured you, you will not be forgiven by my Father in heaven. It's a total hypocrisy to walk into the confessional seeking God's forgiveness when we refuse to forgive others for the way in which they've injured us. So we have to be, that's another area where we have to be attentive. And typically it's anger is the bad boy here that gets in the way and confuses our soul and literally tears it up. The first victim of anger is almost always ourselves. And if it lingers too long, then other victims populate because we lash out in many ways at others, and we not, might not even be aware of it. Anger is very common today. There's a lot of wounded love in our society. And so we need to do what Christ bid us to do. Pray for your persecutors. Uh, love your enemies. Pray for them. Forgive them. Greed. Our, do we treat others as objects for our own benefit? Are we exploiting others in any way? Not only if we have a business and employ them, but just, just in general. To what extent are we driven by such a desire for material possession, things, wealth, that we don't take into account the injustices we may be doing uh, to human beings as a result of our greed? That's a problem in our society today. Envy and its close kissing cousin, jealousy. Envy is resentment at the success of others. Their good looks. Why did she get such a good husband? And look at my lousy you know, mistake here. Uh, or look at the, uh, th this person at work got a promotion that I, de I have deserved. Or some other mother's child won an award at school that my kid deserved. That's envy. It's a resentment at the blessings and the goods that others receive. It can get us to do some pretty nasty things. It can cause us to lie and cheat and steal, to commit adultery, to do all kinds of things out of, out of a simple resentment of the success and the goods of others. And jealousy is related to it. Usually, sometimes they're used synonymously, but jealousy is a refusal to share what I have with others when there's a legitimate claim that others have on my time, on my talents, and so on. Where we want to hold on to something and not, and not um, share it with others. And actually, in this, in this area, it's perhaps worth mentioning the sins of omission. My time, we can be awfully jealous about our time to the point where yeah, I really don't have time to help that poor person who needs some help right now. I'm too busy. And so our jealousy, our desire to protect our own time oftentimes causes us to lose opportunities to exercise charity when we could easily have done so for the great good of another, of another person in need. And that's, that's a sin of omission. A failure to speak out when we see someone else treated unjustly would be another one there. Kind of a concern for how we might be perceived by others if we came to the defense of this person. And there's a lot of judgment that's often involved there uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> lust. Uh, our society is so saturated with sexual imagery today in the popular culture that it's hard to even, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to drive down a freeway and not have lustful images presented before us. And certainly, the social media that we have today, the internet, are ways in which people get sometimes even unintended access to really shocking uh, pornographic material. And we know that 
large numbers of, of people, even in our pews, um, are even addicted to those kinds of images. And we can't, sometimes, uh, I've preached on this before, and I've had people come up resentful that it's even mentioned. What do you mean? I'm married, I'm, I'm an adult, I have a right. I'm going, yeah, but have you considered what you're doing in terms of this? You're not only poisoning your own soul and imagination with these images, but you're also participating with a business that exploits and abuses men and women and children too. And that, that's, a, that's, a, that's participation in and support for a social sin. Um, we should regard ourselves and all human beings as temples of the Holy Spirit and never as an object of physical pleasure. Um, I, you know, on retreats, I hesitate to talk about gluttony because there's always way too much food and it's good and stuff like that. But, and indeed, the church has kind of de-emphasized that. But there are certain things about, uh, that are kind of attached to gluttony and pride. If I go to a restaurant and the food isn't exactly as I want it, do I always complain about it? Do I take it out on the person who's serving the food and don't give them a tip? because I didn't think that dish was particularly good. There are ways in which that sort of what I would call obsession with the quality of food that we have can, be, can have a kind of a tinge of gluttony in it. And treating food as a kind of an idol rather than as what it is, you know, to nurture our bodies and to give it only the importance that it ought to be given. And given the number of shows about food on television right now, my God, it's just, you can't turn a channel where there isn't some chop this or fry that or deceive the cook or whatever, whatever it is that's, that's on there. So we have an obsession in our culture with food. Am I, am I participating in that or not? I talked a little bit about shame. Um, there's also the problem of, uh, shame and some other emotional states of the soul are not on the seven deadly sin list, but they can be areas of potential spiritual problem. Shame in particular is that, that voice that says, you're not worthy. Well, there's one sense in which that's true. None of us is worthy. But we are made worthy. We, we proclaim that right before we receive uh, communion. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. That act of humility, uh, recognizing that we are worthy because we are made in God's image and likeness, because we have been, been redeemed at the price of Christ's blood. God didn't do that because we're unworthy. We're worthy, and we're made worthy uh, by God with the gift of, of a rational soul capable of knowing, loving, and serving him. So shame is something, um, self-loathing, a sense that we're just not worthy of God's love or grace, that is, that's the devil whispering in our ear, and we have to just cast that aside. Um, similarly, sorrow, sadness. There's no question that uh, that's a natural response to the loss of anything, whether it's the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, the loss of income, the loss of a reputation, um, the loss of a pet. The, I mean, there's all kinds of losses that we experience in our life. But what is it that the Beatitudes say about that? What is it that Jesus said? Blessed are those who mourn, uh, implicit in that, with trust in God's love, for they will be comforted. So we don't want to, we don't want our, want our grief, our sense of loss, to become an occasion for the denial of God, which frankly it often is, especially when we lose a loved one, that we've prayed real hard, God, please heal them and, and, and save them, save their life, and they die. We can easily, our anger at God at that moment uh, is, is particularly acute. And uh, so we want to, there's a thing called good grief, which is that, yeah, we want to grieve the loss, but we want to do so confident 
in God's love and with a desire that one day when we die, we will have an opportunity to be with those whom we have lost. After all, what man-child born in the world isn't going to die? It's going to happen to us all. And so we need to check the kind of the temperature of our sorrow and our sadness at all kinds of losses that exist in our life. And to, and to recognize, as St. Ignatius did, that this is part of the disconsolation, and we need to trust God through the disconsolation until he comforts us with the warmth of his grace and with the help of time makes us aware once again of his holy love for us. Uh, and then, of course, hatred. Hatred is not listed specifically on the list of deadly sins, but if there's somebody we just can't stand and we, we literally hate them, we would like to, we wish them ill will, that's completely inconsistent with the love of God and the love of neighbor. And so where we sense hatreds in our life, I mean, two lists that I recommend. The list of people that we need to forgive so that we, we won't fall into a consistent pattern of hatred of any person, all of whom are children of God, sometimes wayward, sometimes lost themselves, our prayer should be that they get the grace they need to get to heaven. And then there's, there's another list. That's, that's what I would call our hit list. The hit list. The people that have harmed us that we'd like to get back at if we could. We need to forgive them. A hit list. And then there's another list. Who is it that we should go ask forgiveness from? We don't often think about that. But if we've got a long hit list, it's highly likely that those people have a long hit list that includes us on it. And so we need to think of, is there someone I should really seek forgiveness from? That's a great way to do an examination of conscience as well. Um, confession is, the sacrament of reconciliation is a doorway from the land of mortal sin and disconsolation into the land of consolation and sanctifying grace. And what we're doing is leaving the darkness of sin behind, rejecting evil and choosing good. And when we go through that portal, when we hear those words, I absolve you from your sin, that sinner, the priest, who represents the church that we've wounded, the body of Christ, the church that we've wounded by our sin, and who is also the voice or the God's representative on earth, we can then open a door that looks out on the glories of the kingdom, at least the foretaste of them, and the promise of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of faith and hope and love, the fruits of gentleness and patience and kindness and humility, the fruits of peace and of joy. And if we stop to think about it, who wouldn't want to live in a country like that? Rather than a, in a land of backbiting and conflict and darkness and sin popula populated on top of sin. That's the great gift that awaits us in the sacrament of reconciliation, which many of you have already experienced today. After this talk, some of you may conceive a need to go back again. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to confession, it represents that beautiful doorway into the, into the beauty of sanctifying grace and the abundant life that Christ promised us if we but accept his love. And that's what the sacrament ultimately is about. Let's just take a few moments of, of silence to prepare ourselves for this beautiful sacrament.
Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.